welcome to Let's Play Rule the Waves 2 as France, starting in 1920. This is episode 98, and I'm looking at the post-game analysis of what I've learnt and what I've understood from playing this wonderful game over the last year and a half. I got up to fleet design, and so let's unpack this a little bit. By fleet design, I mean the mix of ships. How many battleships to build versus how many destroyers or submarines or coastal defenses and what kind of planes to build and all of that kind of stuff. There's a lot that goes into a navy and it's easy to kind of do it through a heuristic, a rule of thumb. Oh, that feels right. Um, but interesting to kind of look in a slightly more analytical way. So, first of all, the big question. Battleship versus carrier. This is the age where the power of the battleship relatively diminishes versus the power of the carrier, which substantially increases. And I've tried to represent this in this graph. So, in 1920, the battleship was essentially 100% of the strength of the fleet. It was the dominant, the top predator, the, the thing by which strength was measured. And yes, the carrier was this uh, promising parvenu that was coming along with its innovations and its new capabilities, but they were very, very uh, at the start. You know, the planes were slow. 100, 150 knots. Their range was short 100 nautical miles or, or a little bit over. The weapons they carried were light, you know, 250 pound bombs, 14 inch torpedoes. Um, they were still interesting enough and Washington Naval Treaty absolutely recognized that, that interest. But at the beginning, they still were very much a secondary force uh, that were there to enhance the battleship and not replace it. And then gradually, the power of the battleship, the power of the carrier increased um, throughout this period until you get to 1955 and the end of the game. And I would argue that the battleship is around about 30, 35% the power of the carrier, um, certainly in the game. Probably in actual 1955, this graph would probably be lower uh, with the development of jet aircraft and uh, stuff like that. But um, in game terms, the development seems to stop around about 1945. And so you have this long flat period where both kind of coexist. The carriers have the advantage in daytime uh, and in fair weather. Uh, but they are limited and by poor weather and nighttime. And in those circumstances, the battleship is the more powerful weapon. And certainly in the late Second World War, battleships were still very, very viable. And the United States Navy maintained their battleships into the early 50s, as did the Royal Navy, even if just placing them in uh, reserve uh, for the British as uh, budgets were rather tight. Determined upon this was the improvement of aircraft range and the improvement of aircraft lethality and the improvement of anti-aircraft defense that was never quite as good as the improvements of aircraft range and aircraft lethality. Had air defense been just a few percent more accurate, then actually this graph would have been very, very different. Um, had the uh, planes been easier to shoot down or shoot down before they released their weapons, the effectiveness of carriers as strike weapons would have been a lot, lot less. But it wasn't. This meant that you have kind of two forces, two periods in carrier development. The first one from about 1920 through to late 39, maybe 40, 41, 
you know, in 41, the Americans were still using biplanes on their carriers. Um, here, you have this find, fix, and destroy tactic for the carriers. The carriers are the primary scouts, but they're the secondary strike force. Uh, their striking is really there to try and damage some ships, to slow down the enemy force that allows the battleships to catch up and sink them. Think Bismarck. Think the poor Italian heavy cruisers at Matapan. That was the expected set of operations in this period, and rightly so. The battleships were the primary striking force, and the battleships were secondary. I initially wrote escort. They weren't an escort. They were a shield. Everyone knew the carriers were very vulnerable, very, very vulnerable. Um, so they would always be behind. They would always be at the end of the line or slightly detached. They couldn't be detached too far because the range of the planes at that time weren't so great that the carriers could operate a great distance away. And this flipped in early 1940s with the development of significantly more powerful engines, primarily aircraft engines. And it became a fine strike and raid arrangement where the carriers would remain the primary striking force, sorry, the primary scouting force, and also become the primary strike force. And the battleships would be the primary escorting force for the carriers, trying to keep them safe from either air attack or surface attack. And the battleships would be this secondary raiding force against the carriers. So if you could dash through bad weather or through nighttime and reach the carriers on the other side, then the battleships would have an excellent chance of capturing and destroying the enemy carriers. And the Americans were very alive to this. They they tried it. They tried it to the later Gulf, where Halsey sent his um, battleships to try and get the Japanese carriers. Obviously, the Japanese carriers was a fake force, and they'd already left. Um, and it's very doable. You know, if you're 200 miles away and you've got a force that can sail at 20 knots, well, that's 10 hours. That's a night time. So that was always in the minds of the um, admirals at this period and it holds true i think for the whole thing but this flip period is the most interesting when when this and it, it doesn't like it just gradually goes uh that way so just be aware of that when you are deciding how many carriers to have to how many battleships and remember the battleships never fully lose their utility and the carriers increasingly become more powerful over time then the rest of your fleet so you've got your what i've called fleet escorts your heavy cruisers which can also do these raids and attack carriers uh, overnight uh, obviously they're there primarily to do cruiser engagements they're there to do scouting both on the surface in you know old style uh, again in bad weather and at night using their line of sight and then their radar but also using air if they carry uh, scout planes and they're there to uh, help dominate night fighting light cruisers um, similar but they also add this destroyer defense uh, part to the equation destroyers they're always to threaten the battle line uh, with torpedo attack to engage other destroyers to do the knife fight that is always almost always knife uh, night fighting and to screen against submarines and then finally one area that i didn't play that i'm always interested in and have never quite made to work but weirdly would love to which is seaplane tenders um i probably should call them something like seaplane cruisers because tenders on their own like carriers would probably be too vulnerable they obviously would have scout planes for uh, reconnaissance and then a light cruiser armament. And what putting them onto a seaplane tender could do is, first of all, you could use it to attach to your slow battle fleet. So in your 1920s and 30s, you're going to have a 21 knot 
battle fleet, and a seaplane tender can scout for them. Um, and then you can do a fast seaplane tender, 28 knotter or something, and have that with your carrier fleet so that the seaplanes on your seaplane carrier do the scouting and you don't have to waste torpedo bombers or particularly, I guess, dive bombers in going out and doing scouting. So, and you free up space on your cruisers to have more weapons. Trade protection. So again, of course, cruisers on trade protection. Personally, I only use these if um, the enemy is, is using raiders. Um, and ideally, I would use an older heavy cruiser if they can be spared. Um, old destroyers, of course, are just forever too useful to, to scrap. Old destroyers, of course, are just forever too useful to scrap. I think Rule the Waves 3 is going to fix that. Uh, corvettes as the mainstay of your anti-submarine force. Um, and minesweeping corvettes can contribute to your trade protection force, but you need some on active fleet in order to protect the active fleet from running into uh, mines. And even then they still might. Uh, trade attack. I haven't found tr trade attack particularly helpful, um, but, and of course, if I'm blockading my enemy, there's no trade to attack. That's the best trade attack. Uh, using raiders is fine if I've got some cruisers who I don't want to appear in uh, cruiser engagements because they're just a little bit too old. Um, submarines, particularly mines and mediums. Well, the mines just seem expensive and prone to loss. Mediums, obviously the best all-rounder. Coastals, if you're confident that you're going to only have a war with people with the same sea zone. And then finally, armed merchant cruisers. Again, I sus suspect their utility. It takes them eight months to enter service, four months to build, and then four months to, to train. Uh, and then, you know, they're easily countered by real cruisers. Um, so I've never really successfully used our um, merchant cruisers. And then finally, Imperial Defense, uh, sending your colonial corvettes as the mainstay of your Imperial Defense in areas where you think the enemy are going to come, then sticking an old battleship or sticking some old cruisers might be useful. Yes, they could be overwhelmed and yes, they'll be more expensive than the corresponding corvettes, but they might be a battle force to hold things off until your main fleet arrives uh, from afar. So I'm thinking Southeast Asia would probably benefit from uh, some cruisers or battleships, certainly cruisers waiting for the main fleet to arrive primarily there to help ward off any invasion, if that's possible. Investing in coastal batteries and uh, motor torpedo boat flotillas. Um, I did build quite a few motor torpedo flotillas. They never really did anything, so far as I'm aware. Um, let me know if your experience is different. So this is, aside from your big ships, this is all your other ships. And Imperial Defense is a must and trying to do it on the cheap seems to be the most logical option. Just cherry picking one sea zone where you might want to deploy something a little bit bigger and one sea zone where you want to ward off the risk of coastal invasion. Trade attack, I'm doubtful on, particularly if there's a chance that you're going to get a blockade on your enemy anyhow. But trade protection, is an old destroyer and corvette kind of thing in the main so you just need to have the right kind of numbers you can't avoid that so like trade protection bits and imperial defense are not discretionary spends you just have to do it and then finally your fleet escorts so certainly in my next game i'm going to play with a seaplane tender seaplane cruiser kind of configuration, possibly a slow one for the battle fleet and a fast one for the fast battleships. Heavy cruisers, I found heavy cruisers, I think, more useful than light cruisers. 
obviously they can crush light cruisers they can you know distract a battle fleet um if you your own battle line goes one way and your heavy cruisers go another way that does you know interfere with uh, the enemy's battle fleet in the center or allows your battle fleet to draw away the enemy's battle fleet and allow your heavy cruisers to go for the carriers or for a convoy keeping a fleet of modern destroyers i did find hard but also really important and my modern destroyers uh my kind of the 1930s destroyer uh, torpedo orientated destroyers did great service and then my two and a half thousand tonners with sams did great service in the late 40s and 1950s so really important for them which kind of puts the squeeze onto your light cruisers um Possibly if you don't go down the sea plane tender route, then you can build more light cruisers with scout planes on them. But um, yeah, let me know what you think. But for me, heavy cruisers, destroyers, and a fast and a slow seaplane tender would be the way that I would try and balance it out. Doing the minimum for trade protection, doing the minimum for imperial defense, with the exception of a sea zone that's um, at risk of invasion, uh, and not really bothering with the uh, trade attack. When it comes to aircraft, um, your fighters are absolutely essential. I spent a lot of effort making sure my fighters were up to date. And that was money well spent. Of course, their cap and their strike escort abilities are essential. And I feel that you need, you know, one on your carriers, one dive bomber squadron, one torpedo bomber squadron, one escort squadron, one cap squadron. So that would make a ratio of two, one, one. Now you can play around with that. You could have a ratio of two, one, three. Two torpedo bomber squadrons, obviously smaller sized, um, because the torpedo bombers, those torpedoes are by far the most effective strike weapon. One dive bombers, because in a coordinated attack with torpedoes going low and uh, dive bombers going high, it is more effective in diminishing the enemy cap and the enemy air defense because you have to split targets and then three here because you've got the choice of either sending two squadrons as escort and one as cap or if you're in a very high threat environment having two as cap and one as escort so that would be three one two so either of those two ratios i think works very well your maritime patrol aircraft Brilliant for scouting and for ASW. Your float planes um, are, are kind of difficult. Uh, I've moved towards putting them onto seaplane tenders, or you can spread them out amongst your bigger ships. They never really get very much better. I mean, they start at about 100 mile nautical mile range and they get to about 200 nautical miles and then just the aerodynamics of having giant floats stuck underneath a plane and stuff means that you know i've said 1950 but it's probably actually 1945 or even 1940 they kind of plateau and they never really get any better um airships i think are incredibly cost effective <laughs> um their research ends in 26 they do have little parasite fighters, which may occasionally shoot something down and extend the search range of the airship. They don't seem to take combat losses. Um, I did watch them and I was only ever seeing operational losses. Now, they're relatively expensive, but if they don't take the losses, then, you know, they're also relatively economic too. Um, missing from here, my mistake, is medium bombers. And on land, medium bombers will overtake the torpedo bombers uh, once medium bombers are able to carry torpedoes. So as soon as that happens, your land-based torpedo bombers should be converted into medium bombers and only use your torpedo bombers on carriers. So that's the 
The aircraft side of the fleet design, focus on fighters, balance out these two, always have plenty of these uh, on land, be aware your float planes plateau, and airships just seem to keep on giving and giving. In terms of your ships, obviously your fleet carriers are your primary ship, and build them big, as big as you can, 70 and then later 100 plane um they're just more effective yes if you lose one it's a bigger loss but they can put together bigger more capable well coordinated strikes and you can very comfortably increase the ratio of fighters uh, on these ships i did do the maths between you know is it better to have two light carriers against one fleet carrier and the answer is no the answer is no, because the light carriers kind of cost half of the fleet carriers, but struggle to have half of the airplane loadout. Um, because you've got two sets of engines and, and all the rest of it, uh, ship engines. However, a light carrier uh, that is slow, that is just equipped with fighters, as my Lafayette became, can be really helpful in protecting your slow battle line. So those 21 knot dreadnoughts. Uh, then your carriers and your fast battleships can race off somewhere at 28 knots together, knowing that your 21 knot battleships are still going to have some air cover. But other than that, they are slightly less effective than um, fleet carriers. So I would always um, emphasize building fleet carriers. And as, as I've said, seaplane tenders, um, they only need six, maybe eight planes. You know, most search patterns are four to six planes wide. So rather than taking up valuable space on your cruisers and allowing them to um, have a few more gun weapons or torpedo weapons, I now think that putting them into... Uh, two seaplane tenders, a fast one for the fast strike group so that the carrier aircraft don't have to waste carrier planes, and a slow one for your battle line is better than putting your float planes everywhere in your cruisers, particularly because, you know, your battleships and cruisers, they have to stop to retrieve the uh, seaplanes. So, um, yeah, that's a bad thing. So, yeah, I would now recommend that, but... If you have a different idea to that, I would love to hear it. To encapsulate this down into, so where do you put your money? I've come up with this rough ratio. So for each of these significant areas, the building of battleships and battle cruisers, the building of carriers, your fleet escorts, your cruisers, your destroyers, your trade protection force, your trade attack force, your coastal defenses, your imperial defense foreign station requirements, and then finally your land-based air, I recommend that you spend approximately 50% on your battleships and your carriers, obviously primarily on your battleships in 1920, primarily on your carriers in the 1950s. So this part will decrease, this part will increase. 50% because they're just really expensive and they are the centerpiece of your fleet. They are the thing that will deliver victory in naval battles. 20%-ish on your cruisers and destroyers. Now, that will increase, but I'll explain later, but a kind of minimum on that. Trade protection, you kind of just have to... Um, get to a decent number of ASW and that's game size dependent you know are you playing with a small fleet or a super large fleet but once you get into the kind of numbers where you will always match the threat um, and it also I think depends obviously on the size of the submarine force you're facing but 2030 uh, is usually enough a mixture of corvettes and old destroyers of course once that's in place then you can minimize the expense just increase the asw outfit as asw technologies come into force trade attack 
try and avoid, um, if at all possible, blockade is a far superior weapon than any kind of raiding will ever be. Obviously, occasionally you can't impose a blockade, and so raiding may become uh, something, and you'll have to borrow them from probably the older elements of your fleet escort. But yeah, ideally, blockade should be your way to go here. Coastal defences, I'm now of a mind that, you know, you should probably only defend areas where they are likely to be uh, invasion targets. Now, I know that's problematic for, say, Britain, um, but for everybody else, that will tend to reduce it down to a number of uh, sea zones. So for France, parts of the Mediterranean, if you think you're going to be at risk of invasion from the Italians uh, or possibly the British in also for the French I guess um, Southeast Asia for say Germany are you really that bothered if you lose some of those colonies unless you've built it up as a major base to have a battle with the likes of Japan so again once this is sorted out a bit like um trade protection then you know you can pretty much minimize your spend here imperial defense ditto so once you've got enough to cover your imperial defense requirements with a few spares because you may lose some during wartime you may uh, need to modernize some as they become obsolescent and so on then you can minimize the spend on that so i've said 20 percent for the fleet escorts but actually that will increase once your trade protection and your coastal defense and your imperial defense costs have been sorted out and you can factor in those costs back in to fleet escort and push that up towards 30 percent then finally land-based air 20 percent of your spend as as an estimate obviously in the 20s it's a bit less than that and you can uh Put that money elsewhere but certainly by the late 30s you should be spending around about 20 percent of your income on um, on land-based air obviously once it exists it can be put in reserve um, and you can create uh, an air fleet that can use all of the air bases in any one of the sea zones that you need to protect so one air fleet for france moving between northern europe or the mediterranean or southeast asia um and it's just a rough guide but that kind of thing is i think a useful one the one that always gets a bit pinched i find uh, certainly in the way i play is the fleet escorts um because you always want to invest in your capital ships and you always want to um invest in your land-based air and trade protection and coastal defense and imperial defense are kind of must-haves. So fleet escort is the one that's always, I think, under the most pressure. I certainly found it difficult to build all of the cruisers and all of the destroyers I wanted. So for me, I found it effective to prioritize heavy cruisers, including downgrading the Desai battle cruisers into being heavy cruisers. They proved to be enormously useful for 35 years uh, and prioritizing the destroyers, both because when they become old, they can become part of your ASW fleet and because in fleet actions, they're very, very useful. Now, it's not to say that light cruisers aren't useful or airship uh, airplane tenders aren't useful. They certainly are. But um, if I had to... Um, prioritize where I spent that money it would probably be on those two so I hope that's a, a, a useful guide to roughly what you should be spending where and that's it for the fleet design I think I'll stop here before I go into battle tactics because there's a lot to say about battle tactics so um join me again to hear about that in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching this.